The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. How much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish. You know what that is? That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. Because the Lamb of God... The, 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 lamb, the, the lamb of God that was offered to sacrifice in the, under the old covenant had to be a, a lamb without blemish and spot. That's 1 Peter 1.19. 1 Peter 1.19. <clears throat> that means no birth defects and no growth defects to the day of slaughter, to the day of, of the blood offering. And the word blemish is here. How much more with the blood of Christ who offered himself, right, through the eternal spirit. You see, now he's, he's driving us to a point. He's explaining then, driving us to a point. How much more <clears throat> offered, offered himself without blemish to God. That's the son and the father, isn't it? The son and and, and what is all that between the Son and the Father? The requirements that had to fulfill his mission on earth. Right? We talked about that. He's got to be. And so uh, without blemish means that he who, here's 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's what that means. That's uh, impeccability is what we call that impeccability. He who knew no sin, and I mean Christ, He's virgin birth, and then He has to be impeccable to go to the cross. He has to be without sin to bear our sins, and so that that's how that that's what that means when He says He offered Himself without blemish to God. That's the Son offering Himself back up to the Father. And listen, when he says it's finished, that's a big deal between him and the Father. That's a big deal. Whether it's a big deal to the rest of us, it's a big deal to him. Um, and then the word cleanse is used. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. So when we come back, of course, this is part of a greater passage of Hebrews 9 especially verses 11 through 15, but let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into this. Find out what this dead works is. Cleanse our conscience to those who believe that, that Christ came and died for our sins, not his, but for ours and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. The Lamb of God that's come away to take, come to take away the sin of the whole world. When we come back, we'll talk about what it means to have your conscience cleansed from dead works, from to, to serve a living God. Okay? Let's have an offering of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. This is true for those who have come by automobile to our assembly and those who, are, who have dropped in off the Internet we ask you to use the same classroom etiquette. That is, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. It cannot be understood apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you have believed the gospel of Christ, he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Then he indwells your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And he's there to teach you the word of God. He's called the spirit of truth by Jesus in Matthew 14, 15, or in John 14, 15, and 16. And so it's important to take that seriously when you study the word of God. He's there to teach it to you, and not only to teach it, but to live it out through your life in application. You can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins, but they have to be confessed before you study the Bible because otherwise you're in carnality. You can't study the Bible in the flesh. 
So 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. This is the operation in the Christian life of sanctification. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour. Learn to learn it under the spirit and then learn to apply it under the spirit ministry. Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God into our souls as we look at what is this. The blood of Christ cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve a living God. Do we want to serve a living God? Yes, sir. We want to serve a living God. For some, like the Jews, and for others who are religious without Christ, <laughs> what does that mean? Cleanse our conscience from dead works. N encourage our hearts to understand it tonight, Father, so that we might be cleansed from dead works to serve a living God. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> well, as I mentioned my introduction, it's a question, and the question uh, falls under the umbrella of how much more, how much more important is the blood of Christ who offered himself without blemish to God um, to do a couple things, to cleanse you from something to something. Now, I love that about God. You know, when he takes something from me, he's always prepared to put something better in its place. Therefore, we can approach Romans 8, chapter verse 28 with great confidence. You know, that makes a, a big difference about it. It's one thing to know. It's another thing to apply it under um, pressured situations. But anyhow, uh, what we're after in this passage is we're after uh, the discussion that's been directed towards one of the cleansing works of the blood of Christ from the cross on the human soul. That's what we're looking for. Now, there are a lot of, a lot of cleansing work uh, done, but they're at, he, the writer is after one thing in chapter 8, 9, and 10, and that's the superiority of the new covenant blood over the old covenant. And so the writer has again brought us to the subject of the blood of Christ and in one specific area of cleansing that probably a lot of people don't even consider, which was dead works, you, you've got to be cleansed from your dead works to serve a living God. Um, the word cleansing is used a great deal in the, in the Bible, and, and it me, means just exactly what it says. It's, you know, the blood of Christ is, it does its cleansing work in your life, uh, not only in regard to not only in regard to Adamic sin, but maybe to a way you built a religious life in your, in your how you built a, a religious life in yourself. Because that's what he's dealing with with dead works. This is not due to Adam's sin. This is due to choices you've made uh, in, in religious tones. Apart from Christ apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit, apart from grace, salvation. And this is what he's talking about. And, and he has offered himself without blemish to God to cleanse. That's a present active indicative. That's the future tense of why he went to the cross and how it works to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. So we're being cleansed from something to something. Watch this word cleanse. I, Listen, the blood of Christ is going to cleanse me from something to cleanse me to something. You understand that? Okay. <clears throat> so I've asked some questions on your paper. What did Jesus offer to God? What did Jesus offer to God for the blood of Christ to cleanse us? He offered himself without blemish to God. And I explained blemish in my introduction, but here's, a, here's the proof text. 1 Peter 1.19. Make sure you know that. 1 Peter 1.19. <clears throat> because he talks about how the blood of Christ without blemish is offered to God. It's not just any blood. It's not just the blood of Jesus. It's the blood. Listen, it's the blood without blemish. <clears throat> that's been offered. 
it has to be an acceptable sacrifice, and it was. Uh, it's a bigger deal than it is finished. It's a bigger deal than what you might think. <clears throat> what is cleansed in this passage, what is cleansed by the blood of Christ, what's the subject? What is being, what, what is it? Is your conscience, right? Your conscience. The blood of Christ to cleanse your conscience. Right? Didn't say your soul, said your conscience of your soul. You remember that your soul is, is made up of self-consciousness, conscience, mentality, volition, and emotion. That's how you can identify the soul of man. And what he's talking about is one aspect. Now, when you get saved, the blood of Christ works that whole deal. But he is focused on this one idea that's present in the life of a person that's believed. That hasn't realized something that they have to realize is how the blood of Christ has worked in their life in regard to their religious way of life they've established for themselves that must be changed. Cleansed from something to something. All right? And he talks about the conscience, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but the conscience, you well know that the conscience is, the, is a, a guide to right and wrong, good and evil, right? Uh, carnality, spirituality, depends how far you go in the Word of God, how much you know about what, what is and what isn't. That's a rough idea. The average person would understand what the conscience is, right? We've learned not to let our conscience be our guide. We've learned to let the word of God be our guide. Uh, conscience could put you all, any, all over the place. So make sure if it, if it is your conscience is going to be your guide, be sure that your conscience is operating under the power of the Holy Spirit with the word of God in it. But anyhow, uh, what, is, what is your conscience cleansed from? Your conscience now is cleansed from dead works to what? To serve a living God. Now, now look, don't miss the word dead and living. Right? I mean, you know the difference between something dead and something living, don't you? Right? I mean, you stop, you see a dog on the side of the road, you stop, or maybe you just pull up and look. I mean, sometimes just a pure look will do it. Cleanse from dead works, so that's going to be important to serve a living God. Now, you, you, you probably say, well, I'm not quite sure what dead works is, but I really know what serving a living God is. You know, you're probably wrong on both parts. Let me tell you, a lot of Jews did not know they were in dead works and thought they were serving a living God. Paul, for example. And a lot of the Jews, even after they got saved, we're still continuing in dead works, thinking they were serving the living God. You need to be careful with that because we live under the new covenant, and this is what this is about. Do you know the difference? Listen, if you're under the old covenant, you're in dead works. If you're under the new covenant, you're serving the living God, and you can't do them both at the same time. Conscience is... Cleanse from dead works to a living God. Now, it's important you understand that. What does Jesus want us? Now, listen to me. What does Jesus want us to offer to God on Jesus' behalf? To serve a living God. Why did he give his blood in this regard? It is to serve a living God. But sometimes dead works of religion separate you from being able to do that absolute thing. And we're going to show that to you tonight. Be sure you don't get caught up in religion of dead works religion and fail because of to serve a living God. Because if you're serving living people, that's not serving a living God. And a lot of people, they go to church to serve people. You should go to church to serve a living God. If 
people is your ministry out there, not your, not your worship. They're not the object of your worship. They're the object of your ministry. You need to know the difference of those two things inside your heart. I mean, I know a lot of people who just, they're neck deep into ministry and not into the worship of God. Other people are deep into worship of God, not in ministry. You got to find your balance in there. God wants both of those. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about four things about dead works that need to be cleansed in order to serve a living God. Once you go to Matthew with me, because Jesus dealt with this in Matthew, the 15th chapter, he is dealing with it. In fact, he dealt with it his entire ministry with Israel. Because they were deep in it. <clears throat> Just like many churches are today. They're deep into dead works. And I say that with a broken heart. I don't say that any other way. I say that with a broken heart. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and these are the guys that promoted dead, dead, dead works religion. These are the guys. And they said to him, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? The tradition of the elders is a handbook of how to live under the old covenant without Christ. And it took the principle of obeying the law to the nth degree. I mean, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 23, and he talks about how crazy that got with that whole thing. In Matthew 23. Now, that's the tradition of the elders and and this was this was what this was their key this was their key that carried the doctrines of how to live to serve god okay it's called the tradition of the elders and 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 pay attention as i go through this is he's going to he's going to refer to this three times he says why do your disciples transgress they ask, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? That's a question. And then they gave an example. They don't wash their hands before they eat bread. He answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions? Why don't you throw that handbook away and just go to the word of God? Because in that handbook, you do more damage to the word of God why do, why do you need that handbook? Why don't you let the, the scriptures speak for themselves? Because that is the voice of God. So he challenges them. They ask a question. They challenged him with a question. Listen to me now. Because this is how you talk with people who challenge you. You counter, you counter, you counter question. Listen to what he said. He said, he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions? Then he gives an example. But look what he does. Now pay attention what he does. He, so he gives his example. They give an example right out of their handbook. So he gives them examples out of the scriptures. Listen to what he does. In verse four, if you have a study Bible, you see he's going to lay one out. He's going to go to a scripture. For God said, honor your father and your mother. Then he's going to go to another one. He who speaks the evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. So he just quoted two scriptures. You got them out of, out of Exodus. And then he says, but here's what you say out of your handbook. But here's your handbook. Whoever shall say to his father or mother, anything of mine you might have been helped by, has been given to God. He is, not to, he, he is not to honor his father or his mother, and thus you inv invalidate 
the word of God for the sake of your, tra- your, tra- your tradition. In other words, they were going around what their responsibility should have been if you didn't have a Bible, right? But here's what the Bible says. He's quoting right out of Exodus. They're old, they're old covenant people. He said, listen, your handbook is taking you away from the word of God and has caused you to be an heir. You think in error. Okay. Then he goes. Now he's quoted scriptures twice. Agreed. He's he's forced them into the word of God. They they didn't show up with a Bible. They showed up with a handbook. You've had those people knock on your doors with that little handbook. You hypocrites. You know know what he just called them? Two-faced. A hypocrite was a two-faced. A hypocrite was out of the Greek drama. They would wear different masks. One person could play different parts by just changing a mask. And that's where the idea of you, you're two-faced. You hypocrites, that's what hypocrites mean in the Greek language. You two-faced people. You hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. See, that's what dead works does to you. See, that's dead works. Right there is dead works. You know what they got? They're running around thinking they're just on fire for God. (coughs) And their heart is miles, miles and miles and miles away. They're engaged in dead works. Their heart is far away from me. But in vain, they do worship me. (coughs) Empty worship. Empty, 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 empty. Let me tell you how you know you got. When you go to church and everything, the music is good, and the stained glass, the sun's shining through them, and and everybody's into do Lord, do Lord, do me, Lord. You have this wonderful emote experience. Let me tell you. Do that alone in your car. Do that alone in your bathroom. Do that alone somewhere else in your life without all of the gadgets and see if you can worship God. See how long you last. See how long you last. You know why you don't last? Because your heart's not there. It wasn't there either. Your emotions were. What God wants you to, no matter where you are, I don't care if you're in the belly of a fish. I want you to worship me. I don't care if you got tubes running out of you and doctors say there ain't nothing going on. You know that you're there to worship God. And one of the great ways to serve a living God is to worship him with your heart. With your heart. When your heart is just filled with all kinds of things, you don't know where you can breathe. You don't know if you're going to make it tomorrow. Can you worship God? Is your heart for God? Do you have a heart for God? Are you just a two-faced, phony baloney? Just talk the talk and can't walk the walk, as they say. You're a hypocrite. But in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the precept of men. Let me tell you, when I come here, I poke you hard with the word of God. Well, all he does is, I get this all the time, all he does is teach the word of God. No kidding. No kidding. No kidding. All I do is teach the word of God. And then, then I hear, yeah, and it's his opinion of it. I mean, what's my opinion of this that you don't see with your own eyes? I mean, I don't know. And after he called the multitude to him, he said to them, hear and understand. 
and, and then he gets into their, their issue. He says, not what enters into the mouth that defiles a man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. Then the disciples come to him and, and he go like, you know, you just offended the Pharisees. And he went, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. Let me tell you, if you're offended by my teaching, you're offended by the word of God because that's all I do. That's all I do. I'm not smart enough not to do something. I, I'm not smart enough not to do that. I don't do anything else. Matthew, see, that's Matthew 15. I actually went through 10, I guess, 11, 12. When you, on your own later, when you read Luke 11, 37 through 54, you will see it again. I mean, he, Luke 11, you go to Matthew 23, he, he's after that handbook they got. Throw that thing away and pick up the Bible and start reading it. Today we say, Where, you got, w- let me see your phone. You got the Bible on your phone? They hold up the, you know, the guys that, guy, the other day a guy said, well, I've got my, I didn't, I said, yeah, listen, where's your Bible? He said, right here. I said, well, pull it up and give me the passage. Let me put my eyes on it. If phony baloney and have it, can pull it up. What do you mean you can't pull it up? You're a whiz kid. I'm the guy who can't pull it up. But I can pull my Bible out of my, my briefcase. I mean, I don't care if you want to carry it on your phone. Don't give me none of that phony baloney. Look at me go, hey, he's an old man. He probably don't know. I know what the Bible is. Pull it up. I don't care where you carry it. You can carry it there. Maybe you have a parrot to talk it to you about it. Maybe memorize the scripture. I don't care what you bring in. Just give me the word of God. So, when I broke this passage down, I want you to see what I did. I want you to know that what he was, they were, they were challenging him because all he does is teach the word of God. It disturbs me. It disturbs me that you don't go by this handbook of rules and regulations. And he said, well, listen, I'm not ever going to go by that handbook. And my disciples, if they're true followers, ever go by that handbook. But I tell you what we do go by. We go by the word of God. If you want to bring your Bibles and open up, we can have a great discussion. But you better bring your Bibles. So he's after this tradition of elders. And boy, he fights it all the way to the cross. But in chapter 15, verse 2, 3, and 6, he's after the handbook. Because this handbook was over the top. It was full of ritual rules and regulations, uh, both about salvation and spirituality without any mention of Jesus Christ. And it was over the top about the law. And listen, the law is, if the law doesn't point you to Christ, it isn't biblical. Do you understand that? Oh, my goodness. And so Jesus asked a question. Uh, they ask him a question. He counters the question as we read through it. He explains where, why that's not scriptural. Then, listen, when, when he usually got through with them and showed them from the word of God why that wasn't scriptural, they, they always got mad at him, always picked up rocks or something, called them names, wrote them hate mail, whatever, whatever people do. At least that's been my experience. And all he was saying is that, look, what's the Bible say? Listen, you've got the right to an opinion. Show me in the Bible what, where that is. It was right here on page 34 in the handbook of, no, 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 no. And so, you know what that is? Because of vain worship, this worship, it is vain, it's empty. It has, has it, there's no life in it. There's, when he says it's empty, it's vain, vain worship means there's no life in it. None. How are you going to serve a living God when there's no life in it? So. Dead works. That's dead work religion right there. Matthew 15, it's all over. I mean, if, you're, if you study the life of Christ, you're going to see this warfare going on. I don't care whether it's Matthew or Luke or whatever it is. 
it'd go on in your life too if you'd step up the plate and stop letting these people shove down your throat all this gobbledygook stuff and live for grace and not by law. They, they, but you know, they'd attack you too, but you're, you're too nice. I don't know how anybody attack any of you people, but. <clears throat> now, dead works legalism is what we're talking about. We're talking about dead works legalism is the result of man's futile attempt. Look at verse, look at my point two. Dead works legalism, we just seen it. You can, you can study the book of Matthew. You can look at 15 and 23 for great classic examples. Dead work legalism is a result of man's futile attempt to gain the approbation of God by religious, by ritualistic religious good. Rules and regulations of religion. And I'm going to tell you, two that, two that fought this to their death was Jesus and Paul. They were both outstri- outspoken critics of dead works legalism. If most of you that go to this church are familiar with a great controversy that came up between the church at Antioch, which was a grace church, and the church at Jerusalem, which was a legalistic church. Now, they were both Christian churches. And this controversy got to a point where they, they called a, a church conference in Acts 15 to clear that up. Okay? In Acts 15. So, let's go to Acts 15, because this thing was supposed to be cleared up. They had this great theological conference. And now many of you are familiar with this. But in Acts 15, in verse 1... It introduces, this is how the conference began in 15.1. So men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That a group of people from the Jerusalem church came down to the Antioch church and started a mess. Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them. The brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this theological matter. And so look at the issue was the issue was the Jewish church said the Jewish Christian church said, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. They believe you got to believe the gospel that Jesus died, was buried, and raised, and be circumcised in order to be saved. <clears throat> so they come down to the other church where they don't teach that and go like, look, how many of you guys are circumcised? And said, well, it's none of your business. And uh, they, well, it's the Lord's business. And <clears throat> so they had a controversy. And Paul said, no, we're not going to do that. So this controversy starts. And then in verse verses five, uh, but certain of the ones of the sects of the Pharisees who had believed uh, stood up saying it is necessary to circumcise them. You can see who's pushing this theology. It's the tradition of the elders people that have been saved, still pushing. They've gone to the scripture, but they're still pushing. It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Right. In other words, you got to be saved by circumcision and you got to keep the law in order to be spiritual. And they clear that this discussion goes on theologically in verse 11, they come to agreement. We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are also. So everybody come to a come agreement that everybody who believed the gospel, believed the gospel that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead. They believed, whether they were Jew or Gentile, male or female, rich or poor, you know, you know the deal, <clears throat> were saved, saved by grace through faith and not himself as a gift of God. Okay? <clears throat> Here's where they got in trouble. Yeah, that's good. But I want you to note, I wrote down in your papers, I want you to pay attention to verses 19 through 21 and then 28, 29. In 19, so now they're, they're laying out a theological, they're laying out a theological thesis. 
<clears throat> and, and, and they start in verse 13, and they, 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 are, they are now putting this into a theo- theology doctrine. <clears throat> in verse 19, 20, 21, Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. You see, that already reeks with bad information. We're not, we're not going to trouble them with what? With law. Why, why, why are you do? the law is out. Why are you doing that? What do you mean we're not going to trouble them? trouble them yes the law will always trouble them we'll always keep pointing them to christ that they already have listen it goes on but that we write to them that they abstain from things contain contaminated by idols and from their fornication and from what is strangled from blood you know what that is that's law And who are they talking to? They're talking about Gentiles acting like Jews to be spiritual. You're not spiritual because you keep the law. You're spiritual because you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is apostasy. Why they didn't go up. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's legalism in the back door. That's not legalism in the front door on salvation. That's legalism on the back door, spirituality. They should have nailed it in the bud and we would have, then they, we'd have had a split church earlier rather than drag it out for years. They let that go. Listen to me. They let that go for compromise. There is no compromise with legalism it's either grace or works it's never both you're not saved by works you don't you're not spiritual by works they should have nipped it in the bud yes yes he and barnabas did yes (laughs) yeah they're going to get the, this group is going to get Paul later. But he later wrote a doctrine on yes, he did. But because he didn't nip in the bud here, these people now think they've got they got the hand and they're going to get Paul in, in chapter 21. They're going to get him. That's why you listen, when you have to fight it, you fight it, you fight it strong, you fight it and get done with it. Listen, they won't mess with you anymore. They'll mess. They'll mess, but they won't mess with you anymore. Other than try to kill you and destroy you. Look at verse 28, 29. See, they should have cleaned this mess up and they didn't. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. See, they understand the laws of burden. Listen. Jesus told them in Matthew, the 11th chapter, verses 28, 29, and 30, that he had come to lift that burden from them, right? They understand the law was a burden. They still put it on them. And they, listen, Paul and Barnabas were the only two guys in there to persuade, the, just listen, my job is not to persuade you to believe anything. I try to lay it out as best I can lay it out, and then it's up to the Holy Spirit to teach you and to complete this thing in your life. But I'm telling you, they should have fought the fought. Listen, you, you, you don't surrender the sword when the sword is required. You put the sword up there, and it'll either, listen, the sword always wins. So, so in verse 28, 29, they, 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 they all submit to keep peace in the family. They all submit to put a burden on people that everybody says shouldn't be there. 
and said, well, we won't, we won't really put the heavy load on these people. We won't put on these Gentiles. We won't put the heavy load on them. We'll just put a light load on them. Listen, there is no such thing as a light and a heavy load of legalism. And so they come back, and so they write it into a, they write it into a theologically, theological declaration and put that thing out. It's apostate. Listen, I, m- m- listen, you got to fight the good fight. It will cost you friends. It will cost you, it, listen, it will cost you, listen, it will cost you a lot of people in your church. You start preaching grace, your church will look like mine. You teach phony baloney, you can fill it up every Sunday. Phony baloney, everybody live what they want to live. Listen, you let your conscience be your guide, just go be, have, a, have a good old time. I don't know. I don't worry about all this stuff, I just preach it. I don't worry about it. I mean, you do what you're going to do anyhow. I've learned that a long time ago. Here's what they failed to do, and here's what you've got to understand. You can't let this stuff slide. You cannot let it slide when it's, when that, listen, when you, when they draw a sword on you, and you've got to draw a sword on them, and you have to fight the fight. If they draw a sword, I'm not talking about pull up sword on everybody. That's a holdup. But, you know, when they draw a sword on you, you got to be truthful and honest. This is part of your worship m- m- mojo with God. Now, here's, what, here's, here's why this is dangerous. I want you to put your eyes on 1 Corinthians. This is why this is dangerous. You go like, oh, Ron, I, I know. I know. And I don't pay anybody to come here, so you know how it is. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, I don't know, 5 to 8. Now, you're going to be familiar with this, but this is how this works. I, I'm telling you how it works. Uh, where did I say? 6, 5, 6. You're boasting. You remember this guy was having, you remember having sex with his mother or something like this. I forget now. But remember he was having, and they, they booted him out. You remember they... But they were really cold to longer. No, oh, that's okay. You know, he loves the Lord. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, even, even the writers are going like, listen, what they're doing, even unbelievers are going like, ah. right? And, and the church was being passive about it. They weren't, they weren't confronting, saying, look, this is, this is so far wrong. I mean, every, it, the, listen, our witnesses to community, the way we live is a witness to our community, not just verbally, but Listen, listen, you know, you can flap your gums all day long if you're living like, you know what I mean? I mean, who, who's going to listen to that? But, but, but here's what he's saying. You're boasting. That's what this boasting. Listen, I can, I can be tolerant. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven, now watch this, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. A little leaven. I suppose yeast. A little yeast. Clean out. Oh. Clean out the old leaven. (coughs) That you may be a new lump. Just as you are in fact unleavened for Christ is your Passover lamb. See that? Let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the oven, uh, unleavened bread of, its, of sincerity and truth. A little leaven, people, leavens a whole lump. This is brought out by Paul in Galatians 5, um, I think 7 through 11, same argument. A little leaven, leavens a whole lump. A little leaven, okay? Dead works legalism, a little leaven. And you can't let it. They should have never let that get away without confronting it, right? Never, because it'll come back to bite you. 
It will come back to bite you. Just as sure as the world, it will come back to bite you. After this church conference, Peter comes down several times to visit with the Antioch church. And one in one of his visits, and he was always friendship. Oh, I love you. And a group, you remember, a group of the legalists from the Jerusalem church came down at the same time to visit. And got all over Paul because he was fellowshipping. He wasn't separating himself from the Gentiles. And so he caved in. See how they work? Caved in to their bullying. Afraid of what they're going to say to the big church when they got back. And so Paul rebukes them. Paul rebukes him. Paul drew the sword on him. He said, you're a phony baloney. You know, another term, but. He said, here's what Paul did tell him. He said, Here, here's what you're doing. You're talking, but you're not walking it. You talk, you're, you're a hypocrite. You talk one way and live another with these people. I mean. Would the real Peter show up? Would the real Peter stand up and be truthful one time in his life? See the power of legalism? And once again, see, now, now Paul understands something. He understands how fierce this warfare is. And here is Peter doing the same thing with Paul that he did with Jesus when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block. To my ministry. Come on now. Paul has had to do the same thing with him. This is a fierce competition. This is a fierce enemy to grace. If you think they're going to go by just because you had one skirmish with them, nothing can be farther from the truth. And so in, in Acts, the 21st chapter, Paul, this group gets Paul. They get him in the most unusual way to make peace with Israel, peace with Israel. He takes his contribution, you know this, to the poor that's being just ter terribly sacked by the opposition to the Christian church. And yeah, and so Paul, they say to Paul, listen, you could, you could really heal the church up. You could make a difference. If you just take this guy, I've got, we've got some candidates. If you'll just go through yourself, go through the purificational system, it would, if you will just be a legalist for a little bit, this would make a world of difference. Paul does it. And boy, did he get the hammer dropped on him by God. What God drug him through, he's not ever going to do that again. How about it, Jonah. I mean, if, when you read uh, uh, Acts, the 21st chapter, and see this thing play out, you read Acts 21, 21 through 24. I mean, you go like, oh, Paul. And listen, this shows you how powerful this enemy is. You all right? Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I live that. Jane has that. Yours is probably an accident. Hers is regular. Uh Listen, what's a little leaven do? What's, what's the danger of a little leaven? It destroys, it destroys the whole thing. <laughs> it don't take much. <clears throat> See, the devil is tricky. Is he not tricky? Uh, he's the most, he's the most tr tricky guy. He's deceptive. <clears throat> That's unfortunate, isn't it? It's unfortunate that we, we, we have buttons that are that evident that somebody can push them, right? Listen, we all got buttons, and there's some buttons we don't care if they're, if they're visible. But there's some buttons you push, and the uh, war's on. You know, you know what old Al would say? That's old man divine, that's old man cosmos divine thinking. Get rid of those buttons. Nobody can push them. <laughs> that's what he tell you. Yeah, that's what Jesus would tell you, too. Get rid of the buttons. Don't wear them. 
just have a pullover. <laughs> ain't no buttons. On ain't no ain't no buttons on that shirt. Just if you come here, you're just gonna have to hug me. You're not gonna be able to push buttons. Isn't this the battle that Jesus fought on the cross? Well, he fat, fought it all the way to the cross. On the cross, he fought fought the whole kit and caboodle, didn't he? With with his blood, didn't he? It, listen, I. There's a book called Hebrews, verse by verse, and um, on page 302 it says, "Dead works therefore became the vain effort to relieve a troubled conscience by legal obedience," and and they're talking about this very verse. And boy, that was a good statement. Every once in a while, I can find one like that, and I I pin it. Here's point three. Dead works legalism attacks God's grace. In the conscience of a believer. Let me tell you what's bad about. Let me tell you what's bad about. Legalism. And leaven. Is that when you get it in you. Guess what it does to you. Hmm? Destroys. It destroys. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. A little bit of legalism in your life. Just destroys the whole. The, whole, the, 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 the stuff you've, you've studied and learned. You understand what a little leaven could do? See, when you hear a little leaven leavens a whole lump, you're thinking about somebody else's lump other than yours. Right? You got to be careful on your own. You have to guard your own place. And I'll be telling you, he's tricky. He'll he'll have some legalism in you in a heartbeat. And, and, and when you recognize, you got to get rid of it. Because he, he's found a button. But let me tell you, this, when it says leaven the whole lump, the last place you want leaven is in your life. It's bad enough to have to fight it out here in the church. And let me tell you, I've been fighting this thing in my ministry probably 50 years. And every day I fight it just to win. Man, I ain't won anything. You know, I, I, all I do is get to, to win a day. <laughs> I don't get a break for five years, ten years, whatever. As long as I preach it, I get nailed. And you know why? I fight it. I fight it in my own life. I fight it for you because I don't want leaven to leaven the whole lump. Because it'll do it. Will it? Will it not do it? And, and it's and it's called legalism. And listen, you'll lose friends. You, they'll boot you out of a church when you when you say, "Look, I'm not going to do that." That's legalism. That's law. I'm not going to live by the law. They'll go, "Well, you're not going to do it here." And you're like, "Well, listen, I understand that. I I have no ill feelings." But I'm not going to give up grace for that. I'm not going to give up grace for that. But most of us want to work compromise. uh, compromise. We'd rather have peace than war. But who wouldn't? Maybe there's some, though, would rather have truth than lies. So I stay in the battle because every once in a while I find a person that wants the truth and not the lies. And I said, well, look, you can come and meet with a group of people who believe just like this so you don't feel alone. And so we have this little group. And people out there, they're like that. And I meet them all the time and say, well, come on in. And meet a group of people that are interested in truth. And I hope, hopefully that's you and I. Dead works attacks God's grace in the conscience of a believer. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. The soul consists of self-conscious, conscious mentality, volition, and emotion. Bible doctrine residing, this is what the devil knows when he, when he talked about the sower in Matthew 13. Remember the sower? The sower goes out and he sows, and he sows on this ground, and you know he talks about the four grounds? Yeah, well, he starts right off the bat by saying, and the devil, the devil tries to come along and steal what? The word that's been sown. Okay. And listen, there are a lot of ways to steal it from you. What he likes to get, what he likes to is have you turn it over to him. 
volitionally and willfully like Eve did. Just turn it over to me. You know I have your best interests at heart. Just give it to me. You don't need this. Listen, let's replace what you believe because it's not working for you. So why don't we replace it to what I have for you? That's yeah, easy. He's tricky. Listen. Bible doctrine residing in the soul develops the divine norms and standards of scriptural right and wrong. Not just right and wrong. Scriptural right and wrong. Scriptural good and evil. Scriptural moral and immoral. Scriptural spirituality. Scriptural carnality. You understand? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? You know, everybody's got a problem. Ice. What's the Bible say? They don't know. Yeah, but then that, that that's okay. Depends on whether they want the truth. I will be, I will bear the burden of the truth. You know why? Because Jesus said the truth will set you free. That's what I love about it, and I found it to be an absolute. Dead works legalism substitutes God's grace gospel with a works gospel, like Galatians one six through eight where Paul argues that principle. In the little book, Hebrews by Thomas on his page 114 said, dead works may be associated with good things, but possesses no spiritual vitality or life. It's why it's dead works. There's no life. He's talking about this very subject. In closing, aren't you thankful? The Mosaic law, not the tradition of the elders, was designed by God to teach mankind that they are helpless sinners in need of Jesus Christ to save them. <laughs> listen, to, listen to Galatians 3.24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Faith in what? Christ. What's the object of my faith in this regard? The law has become my tutor to lead me to Christ, whereas my faith is in Christ. He's the object of my salvation. In that Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, you are weary and heavy laden. Listen, in the church conference of Acts 15, they understood that was going to be a burden to carry the law. It's supposed to be a burden. You know the difference between the law and Christ? Christ says, I'm not a heavy load. I will lighten your load. I'm a load-carrying Savior. Cast all your cares upon me. That's the difference. That Matthew, he says in, in that Matthew 11 passage, he says, and, and you will find, listen to me, and you ought to be able to find this. If you can't find it, bring it back. Come, come have coffee with me one morning. I will give rest. R-E-S-T. R-E-S-T. I will give rest to your soul. You know what? Listen, people take more drugs today in America than anything else in the whole wide world. You know what they're after? Peace and rest. They take it in the morning, get through the day. They take it at night so they can sleep through it. It's the darnest thing I've ever seen. You know what my grandmother used to give me? I bet if you had a good person in your family, you know what they gave you? <laughs> Warm milk. <laughs> sure did. There's a guy who grew up with me. Right there, that's what they got you. You want to go to sleep tonight? My grandfather, he would say, yeah, you'll sleep good tomorrow night, son. You apparently didn't work enough today on the farm. I mean, we farmers didn't have problems sleeping at night. But my grandmother, if we did, she'd like, come here, son. I'd just about rather have anything, a glass of warm milk. Can you put some chocolate in it or something, Grandma? Ovaltine. Huh? Ovaltine. Ovaltine, yeah. We must have the same. Yeah, my grandma. We must have the same grandma. We the same age, Oh, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a young man. Listen to this. By the manifestation of truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience. Listen to that. Co listen. Commending ourselves 
to every man's conscience. Think about that. Maybe not tonight so you can sleep, but maybe in the morning when you get up and have a cup of coffee. By the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. When Paul and Barnabas went to the Jerusalem conference, that's what they were after. Listen, for me, the goal of my instructions to you is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That's the best I can bring to you, but I try to bring that. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, they have seared your conscience like a branding iron. <sighs> that hurts me to even think about it. All right, guys. Dead works. Listen, they'll never get you to serve a living God. Set aside dead works to serve a living God. Oh, hey, uh, l let me close this. I've got a prayer request uh, that was called in tonight. L let me close my session right here. For those who are with us tonight by Internet, we pray you would take all this serious with the scriptures on dead works legalism. We're not under law. We're under grace. We live under the new covenant. This is the new covenant blood of Christ. And our warfare is one of great warfare within the body of Christ. And it started from the very first day of our identity as churches. And this is our great fight. It's easy to win the world. Apparently it's difficult nearly impossible because devil has this grip within our theology that somehow we can be we can compromise grace with law and live happily ever after and there's no such thing and so I pray for that I, I pray that we would understand a little leaven leavens a whole lump it does just leaven leaven it leavens a whole lump and so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. We pray for those on the Internet with us like we do with our people here that you pick a night and stay with us. If you're if you dropped in on Tuesday night, oh, we're we're deep. We started in Hebrews eight. We're in nine. We're going to ten. You can pick them all up. Father, just encourage them. They can get them every, everything they need. They can get off of the Internet. But I do pray that they would take seriously the importance of study for their spiritual growth. And that we're thankful to have them drop in and visit with us. Pray they would become good students with us. For we made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.